15. 1 Corinthians in chapter number 15. We are sincerely glad to get to welcome all guests here. I look around and I see that we, uh, well, it feels like a friend day. That's what it feels like. A friend day. We've got a lot of guests, co-workers, friends, new acquaintances, uh, family members, a lot of family members here. We're sure glad about that and trust that this will be a great um, help to you from God's Word. And uh, the music's already been encouraging, so I'm grateful to God for that. Now we have the privilege of opening up God's Word and to read about uh, why we're here on a Sunday morning. And you, in fact, you know, I was just thinking, there might, there might be somebody here wondering, what in the world is this all about anyways, you know? In fact, uh, without God, that's where you are. You're wondering, what, what is this? Why are they excited? Why are they happy about this? Is, uh, hey, this is better than a ball game. Because in a ball game, your team might be doing well and then, then not, right? But here, this is a settled matter, what Jesus did for our sins, and that's why. So I, I sure want to do due diligence to try to make this abundantly clear for those that, that may very well be hearing it for the very first time. And those that have heard it a thousand times should not be weary of hearing it again and uh, because of its truth and validity. So I trust it will be a great help to you. I know the Word of God has promised that it would not return again void or empty without effect. So that's what I'm trusting here today is the Word of God uh, preached. I pray with the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. If you've had time to find your place there, 1 Corinthians in chapter number 15, we'll begin reading in verse number 1, and we're going to read through verse number 23. Now, it's a long chapter, and we're not going to read all 58 verses, uh, <laughs> but I guess I know that you'll get the sense of it as we get into it. Um, it's a pivotal chapter, really, in the New Testament, and so it gets right to the crux of the matter. Let's look at it now in verse number 1. Moreover, brethren... I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which ye also have received, and wherein ye stand. By which also ye are, what? Saved. Saved. If ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. And then he explains in verse number three. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. Okay, I want, to, I want to read that part again. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. You see, our theme even this year, if I could just interject here, is teach them. And so what we've received, we're trying to pass on. That's what Paul is saying here. Well, what did he de deliver, deliver? I'm sorry. And what did he receive? Verse three again, last part of it, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. See, in verse 4, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. Not only that, but verse 5, and that he was seen of Cephas, another name for Peter, then of the twelve, that'd be the designation of the twelve disciples, although there was ten at one time and eleven the next because of the hanging of Judas. Verse number six, uh, after that he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once. Five hundred at once. Of whom the greater part remain unto this present. In other words, you could interview them at that current juncture. Then he says, but some are fallen asleep, which means that they have passed on. Verse number seven, after that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And last of all, Paul says, he was seen of me also. As of one born out of due time, for I am the least of the apostles, that I am not meet to be called an apostle. You, you know what he's saying right there? I, I, I'm not deserving of this. I, I'm unworthy. And he explains as to why in verse number nine, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am that I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. 
But I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preach and so ye believed. Verse number 12. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? Everybody following along right there? Evidently, they, they had some internal conflict. There's some that were saying there's no resurrection of the dead. Am I reading that right? All right, now look at his reasoning. This is powerful, verse 13. If there be no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. All right, follow the logic here. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain or empty? That effect. And your faith is also vain. Yea, and we be found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. Verse 16, for if the dead rise not, then is Christ not raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain and ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which have fallen asleep in Christ are perished, he says. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. If Christ be not risen, we're a miserable lot right here this morning. Oh, mercy. <laughs> but I like verse number 20. As he boldly says, but now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man, that be by Adam, which also we participated in that because we're all sinners. For since by man came death, by man, by Jesus Christ, came also the resurrection of the dead. For in, as in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, and after that, afterward rather, they that are Christ at his coming. <laughs> Mercy. Amen. All right. I'm calling it very simply this this morning in terms of a title, Lessons from the Empty Tomb. I hope to, I hope to get across basically two very important lessons from, I'm glad to say it, the empty tomb. Amen. And tonight, Lessons from the risen Savior. Lessons from the empty tomb. Lessons from the risen Savior. So, Father, I'd like to pray one more time. I know we've already prayed, but I'd like to pray again. Um, there's many here that already know what I'm about to preach, and they've said amen even boldly. But there's some here that do not know you as Savior, and I sure pray for them. I, I can't make anything happen. But I know that you, through your word, the power of the Holy Spirit can give testimony to the fact of the risen Savior, convicting them of sin and of their lack of righteousness and the fact of a judgment to come. I pray, God, that you would so arrest their attention that, God, by the end of the message, they would see their need to trust the risen Savior. I do pray, Lord, that it would be an encouragement to all who already are saved and also, God, some that are saved but maybe <clears throat> not living out the implications of this on a daily basis. I pray equally, God, that you would also arrest their attention, dear God, um, because they need you to. And so I don't want to be in the way of that. I want to be a conduit or a means by which that you can speak to hearts. And so help us here to follow along the words that have been preserved for us and to make application very, very clearly. Lord, um, again, I thank you for everybody that's here. Thank you for everyone that is already saved and even those that are going to be baptized today, picturing the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior. We praise you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for standing in honor of God's word. <clears throat>
I read of a little eight-year-old boy with Down syndrome who was in the third grade, special needs in many ways. And you can imagine third grade, picked on by his peers, different than they, special. Special, amen. It was in Sunday school and the teacher had an idea that they would reiterate the fact of the importance of new life through Christ. So gave them all a little, one of those plastic eggs and told them to go outside and find something that would symbolize new life. And so they came back in and they're all sharing their uh, findings. And so they opened up, you know, one of those and found a flower representing new life. And, and the class was saying, oh, and especially the girls, right? And a butterfly and a leaf. And then they opened up one and it was empty. And they all said, somebody didn't do their assignment. Well, the little boy with Down syndrome said, that's mine. But I did do the assignment. You see, it's empty. And because it's empty, the grave is empty. We have new life. Hey, I believe he taught them a lesson that day, don't you? 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is, is as I mentioned a moment ago, I, I believe a very pivotal chapter. I, I, I mean, in fact, I, I really believe that Paul, under inspiration, saved this truth about the resurrection for the very latter part of the letter to really drive point, the point home. And in fact, someone said that this is the most in-depth study of the body, bodily resurrection in the all of Scripture right here in 1 Corinthians 15. You can see it by just by the length of it that the, it has 58 verses, it must be very significant. Well, it is. It is indeed. Paul began his letter talking about how that the preaching of the cross was foolishness. Foolishness unto the, unto the Greeks. They, they thought it foolish that you would worship a man who hung on a cross. It didn't make sense to them. And so it's no wonder then that he would conclude the same letter emphasizing the truth of the resurrection. You see, the trouble in the, in the Corinthian church, and I, I want to deal with why this letter was written. Well, the church was made up of people that were saved and baptized and trying to follow the Lord. Here is the main problem in Corinth, like many churches, including ours today, we're greatly influenced by the society that's around us. Culture has a way of seeping in uh, even to a local church life. And that's exactly what was going on in Corinth. Uh, Corinth was there in, in the region of Greece and, and you have Athens and you have Corinth. I mean, these are major metropolitan cities and, and uh, thinkers and, and people that were very uh, uh, articulate. And so they, would, they really uh, uh, held in high regard those who had a lot of knowledge and, and were able to articulate that. And so... As a result of that, then what was happening is that that Greek culture was finding its way into the church. Greek culture actually has influenced a lot of our world today. I just uh, I have a friend, Brother John Motorosian, that just went to, uh, actually uh, went from Israel to Greece and had a, a, an extended trip there, was able to, to see the Grecian culture. He's been listening to a, an audio book. He was telling me all about it, and he was sharing with me a 10-hour audio book in 15 minutes something like that, but making the case that the Greek culture has really impacted our world. Well, as you think about it, the Greek culture had influenced the world that Jesus lived in. In fact, the, the New Testament, you have the Old Testament written in Hebrew, the New Testament written in Greek. So even that alone shows you that the Greek thinking had an influence on that society. It had an influence on the Jews. It had an influence on the Roman culture. And thus, it had an influence on our culture as well. And so the reason I mention that here on this Easter Sunday morning is simply this, is that part of that Greek culture was to sneer or to scoff at the idea of a resurrection. In fact, in Acts chapter number 17, in verse number 32, when Paul was preaching at Mars Hill, uh, there in Athens, Greece, it says, when they heard of the resurrection, listen to what it says, when they, when they heard, when those people that were gathered together, they were just listening to the Baptist preacher preach. And as he preached, he mentioned how Jesus rose again. And here's what it says, some mocked. Some mocked. They mocked the idea of a resurrection. Well, it's being mocked today. Should we be surprised that it was mocked back then? And so that was what was going on. And so according to verse number 12, 
in our text and even other verses that are in our text here, there was some even that was kind of finding its way into the church to say there is no resurrection of the dead. And Paul took issue with it. And rightly so. And, and we're getting back into that. But here in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul is saying, listen, I am, I am delivering to you what I also received. And I did not receive this just by tradition. Hey, let me, let, me just, let me just cut right to it here this morning. We are not here in this church assembly because of tradition. No, that's not it. I, and I'm not, against, I'm not against all tradition. I mean, there's a lot of good tradition. We'll, we'll have a good traditional Easter meal here in a few moments. The preacher ever let you out? Right? There's not a, not a thing wrong. But listen, our basis of faith cannot be tradition alone because tradition can be wrong. And there's a lot of people called in a lot of tradition today. Okay? So Paul didn't pass this on because of tradition. He did not pass this on because of men of significance and stature like Peter or James or John. Hey, thank God for those men. But listen, it was not the words of men. So we're looking here at this as Paul is dealing with the central message of the Bible. And if you look back at verse number one, he says, Moreover, brethren, I delivered unto you the gospel. You know what the word gospel means? Good news. The gospel wherein ye stand. Can I remind you that at one time they stood in their sin? Condemned? Look back at chapter 6, would you please? Uh, just turn back a few pages. 1 Corinthians chapter number 6. I want you to see this and, and how that they once lived. Chapter 6 and verse, verse number 9. He says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? You know what he's saying right there? In your unrighteousness, you can't go to heaven. Is that what he's saying? And, and look, look how their unrighteousness manifested itself, okay? So the problem this morning that all of us have is sin. Okay, and look how it manifests itself in their life. The unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Look at this. Be not deceived. Don't, 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 get, don't get duped or twisted in your thinking here. Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, that'd be those who are involved in sexual sin, really of any type. It's a broad term. Boy, isn't sexual sin prevalent in our day and time? Through pornography and through infidelity and adultery and, and people involved sexually outside of marriage. Hey, friend, listen, that's what the Word of God's talking about here. So he says, neither uh, fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. That's all about homosexuality. Neither thieves, nor thieves, I'm sorry, verse 10, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Are you reading that? Hey, listen, sin is a problem with God. He's holy, he's righteous, he's separate from sin, and he can't allow that into his very presence, see. Well, if all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and you've sinned and come short of the glory of God, and the Corinthians had sinned and come short of the glory of God, then how, pray tell thee, how did they get in? Well, the only way you can get in. That's through a substitute. Through somebody willing to die for your sin, see. All right, and look what he says in verse number 11. He says this, and such, notice this next key word, such, what, were some of you. He says this is how you used to live. You were a fornicator. You were adulterers. You were drunkards. You were revilers. You were idolaters. Such were some of you. Hey, something changed. What did they do? Get on a 12-step program? What did they do? Turn over a new leaf? What they do, join a new society? What what they do, dip themselves in the river of Jordan seven times? No, friend, I'll tell you what they did. They trusted who Jesus was. They trusted the fact that he died in their place, was buried and rose again. And listen, that changed their life. That changed their life. Such were some of you, but look, look at this now, verse 11. But ye are washed, ye are sanctified, ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Hey, the impact of the gospel changed their lives radically. 
All right, let's go back to First, number, first Corinthians chapter number 15. And so Paul says, listen, I deliver to you the gospel, the good news, but to get the good news, you gotta get the bad news, right? The bad news is that you're all sinners. We're all sinners. Didn't mean to exclude myself from that equation. We are all sinners. We've fallen short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, the Bible says. No, not one. So Paul says, listen, remember when I came to Corinth and I preached that you were a sinner, but you needed the Savior? And I preached to you that he was, he died on an old rugged cross, was buried, but also he rose again, and you believed that. And that changed your life. All right, now let's keep going here. Verse number uh, two, he says, by which, by which ye are what? Saved. By which you're saved. Saved from what? Saved from sin. Saved from death. Saved from hell. By which ye are saved. I'm glad I can say to you this morning that if you're not saved, you can be saved. You can be saved through who Jesus is and what he did. You will not be saved through your own good works. If you can be saved through your own good works, Jesus didn't have to come, see. Let me ask you this morning before we move on. Are you saved? Have you been born again into God's family? Do you know for sure? I'm asking basically the same question three different ways to get you thinking about it. If you died today, do you know for sure you'd go to heaven? You say, I, you know, I'd like to. Well, the Bible says you can. Uh, let me ask, just in case somebody just woke up. If you died today, do you know 100% for sure that you'd go to heaven? Can you know that? Well, the Bible says you can. And Paul says you're saved. Okay, now look at the next part of the verse. Everybody still with me right here? Okay, verse number two. By which also you are saved if you keep in memory what I preached unto you. You say, man, if I got to be saved by my memory being good, um, I'm in trouble. No, 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 wait a minute. That's not... He's not, he's not talking about how you keep yourself saved. No, you're saved by the grace of God and you're always saved. But there ought to be evidence of that in your life. This is not the means by which you're saved, but the evidence, is everybody following me right here? The evidence ought to demonstrate that you have had a changed life. Does that mean I never sin again? Oh no, just look around. Just look both ways down the pew and you're going to see a bunch of sinners, maybe saved by the grace of God, but saved, saved sinners, still, in, still dealing with sin, still dealing with issues of life. But Paul says, listen, he says in the latter part of verse number two, which I preach what I preach unto you, unless you have believed what? In vain. Okay, wait a minute. We need to deal with that. What, the word, did you see how many times the word vain showed up? In vain, in vain, in vain, in vain. Uh, the idea here is without effect. Unless, unless you have made a false profession. Unless you have believed without effect. In other words, he's saying this. When you trust Christ as your Savior, it ought to have an impact on your life. It will have an impact on your life. Okay? So let's continue on. Verse number three, he reiterates, for I have delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen. And he goes into a list, not an exhaustive list, but a good list, probably chronologically in order, that he was seen first of Peter, as he says there in, in verse, number, verse number five, then of the 12, as he appeared in their service that night as they were hunkered down in fear, but, but he was seen of them. And then he was seen even of 500 all at one time. You know what he's driving home right here? The faith is valid because it's based on truth. Okay, so there's, there's two lessons I want you to get. Okay, number one is simply this. Faith must be based on truth to be valid. Faith, I, I really want you to, to get this with me here. Faith must be based on truth to be valid. Faith must be based on truth to be be valid. And that's why he's going into, as the scriptures say, here, here's what he's doing, as the word of God says. 
Christ died for our sins. That's the word the word of God says. It's not what the word of man says. It's what God's word says. And that he was buried as the scripture said he would be buried. And that he would rise again as the scripture said that he would rise again. So Paul is pointing them back to the basis of their faith. And for faith to be valid, it must be based on truth. So for your faith, can I apply it this way then? For your faith to be valid, for your faith to be reliable, for your faith to be trustworthy, for your faith to be real, for your faith to be real, it must be based on truth. So how do I know that what this says is true? Well, he said he would rise again, did he? He was seen of Peter. He was seen of the women. He was seen of the, of the 10 and then of the 11. In fact, Thomas said, I won't believe unless I touch his, the, the nail prints in his hands and thrust my hand into his side. And when he skipped out on church that Sunday night, he didn't stay for the whole service. Jesus showed up and he wasn't there. <clears throat> Boy, that'll preach too, won't it? Jesus showed up and he wasn't there. He had to wait till the next week and, and thus Jesus held out his hands and he touched his hands and he touched his side and Jesus ate with them. A ghost doesn't eat. A spirit doesn't eat. You can't touch them. But, but they were, he was able to be touched. He was able to be handled. In other words, Paul is saying, wait a minute, there's some in your congregation that say this isn't real. You know, there might be some here today saying, ah, this isn't real. Now, you're not going to say that out loud, probably. But in your mind, you may be thinking, is there any really validity to this? Let, let me say it this way. Only if it's based on truth. <laughs> Only if it's based on truth. If it's based on something other than truth, then we are here absolutely wasting our time. If it's based just on man's tradition, if it's based on man's ideas, if it's based on, on, on just hearsay, no, 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 wait a minute, friend. It's got to be based on something other than that. It needs to be based on eyewitness accounts. And that's what we have as they went into that tomb. Now, now we had the privilege about a year ago to be able to go to the garden tomb and see the empty tomb. And, and the, these the believers here, they were able to stoop and they saw the empty tomb. They didn't go there expecting to see an empty tomb. But the friend, listen, that's exactly what happened. When they got there, the tomb was indeed empty. Rome didn't deny that the tomb was empty. The Jews didn't deny that the tomb was empty. The Pharisees didn't deny that the tomb was empty. They told, they paid these Roman soldiers to say that they stole his body while we were asleep. How'd you know it was the disciples that stole their body if you were asleep? That's the lie that tells the truth. Everybody get that? That's the lie that tells the truth. Yeah, they came and stole their body. Man, we, we were zonked out. No, 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 wait a minute. You didn't see that then. What if I, what if I said to you, okay, I'm trying to get across here this morning two simple truths from the empty tomb. One would be this. For faith to be valid, it's got to be based on truth. Okay, what if I say to you, you ready? <clears throat> the Kentucky Wildcats are going to win this year's basketball tournament. <laughs> <laughs> Laughing out loud over here. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you don't believe me? You know, you don't, man, come on, Brother Perkle, I'm your pastor. You know. Okay, uh, here, here, here we go. I'm going to repeat. The Kentucky Wildcats are going to win the basketball tournament this year, the NCAA tournament. <laughs> Nobody's saying amen. <laughs> now, there's some Kentucky fans out here that wish that that was true. I can say it real loud. The Wildcats, UK, they're going to win the tournament this year. <laughs> can, can, I, can I help you out here this morning? It doesn't matter how fervent I am about this. It doesn't matter how loud I get about this. It doesn't matter what my heritage is. That's my heritage from Kentucky. It's, it's my team and I put them in in my bracket. I filled one out every year. 
and have them going all the way and winning the whole thing every single year. It does not matter my history. It does not matter their history, which we're creating a brand new history right now. It does not matter their history. It does not matter my loyalty. It does not matter my, repeti my repetition. It does not matter if I have a trophy made. It does not matter what kind of merch I have. It does not matter what kind of banner I have. It does not matter what kind of slick video I have. It does not matter how many false brackets I fill out. What matters, friend, is simply this, the truth. And the truth is, is they went out on the first round. Again, faith is only valid if it's based on truth. It does not matter how loud you are about it. It does not matter how repetitive you are about it. It does not matter what the heritage is that you have is about it. It does not matter what your loyalty is. It does not matter how much merch you have. It does not matter what kind of banners you have. It does not matter what kind of slick presentations you have. If what you believe is not based on the word of God and based on truth, then listen, it is not a valid faith. I want to ask you this morning, is what you believe based on the Word of God? Is what you believe based on the eyewitness account of Peter, James, John, and all the other disciples and the 500 at one time who saw him alive? Hey, listen, is it based on that? If it is based on that, then your faith is valid because it's based on truth. Tr faith, listen to me, faith is only valid if it's based on truth. That's number one. Faith is only effective if it's applied. That's number two. Faith is only valid if it's based on truth. Number two, faith is only effective if it's applied. Paul gets into it. And he's still dealing with the validity of the truth and he deals with it this way. He says, if Christ, let me go, let me, uh, I skipped a whole section and, and I need to hit this because this is so good. He says, if, if Christ, you know, if Christ, verse 12, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some that there's no resurrection of the dead? If there be no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. Isn't that right? His reasoning is right on, isn't it? And he says, if Christ be not risen, then our preaching's vain. It's empty. It has no impact. If he, if he, if it's not true, what did I surrender my life to do? I was 15 years old. Am I wasting my whole life? <laughs> no, <laughs> not since he's alive. You see, not since he's alive. Are you wasting every Sunday being in church, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night? Are you wasting your time? No, not since he's alive. But if he is not alive, our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. It's empty. It has no impact. In fact, verse 15, we'd be false witnesses. We would be telling you lies. And he says in verse number 17, if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain and you're yet in your sins. You've got no hope. You're no, no better than anybody else living in this world. Still yet in your sins. And if he be not risen, then those that have died, they've perished. There's no hope. I saw Brother Yeager walking in here. Brother Yeager, just raise your hand right here. His dear wife went to heaven this year. I preached, I think it's five funerals of members of this church. Five already this year. If Christ did not rise, listen, friend, there's no hope. There's no hope for a Debbie Starks that had just preached her funeral. You listen to me. There's no hope. There's nothing beyond. But listen, Jesus did rise again. And thus we will see those loved ones again. And there is hope. And yes, we miss them here. But I'm so glad this morning as I saw Brother Yeager making his way faithfully down that hallway one more time on a Sunday morning to look and see that your faith, dear sir, is not in vain. Because Jesus is indeed alive and Miss Yeager is very much alive and in his presence. And yes, we did commit her body to the grave. But listen, because Jesus rose again and he's the first fruits, meaning there's more to come, that she also will rise again when it's time for the resurrection day. But right now, her spirit soul is very much in the very presence of the Lord. I lost my place, but this is, I know what I'm saying to you. Verse 19, if in this life all we have is hope in a Christ, in a dead Christ, in a dead Messiah, then we are most men, mo we are of all men most miserable. You know what he's saying there? We're missing out on all the world has and we're getting persecuted for it. 
Everybody get that? That's like a double whammy right there. We're missing out, quote unquote, missing out on what the world has to offer that they can't remember that happened last night. We're missing out on all that and we're getting beat for it, persecuted for it. Well, if Christ is dead, then we are a miserable lot. But now is Christ risen from the dead. And thus our faith is not in vain. And Paul is saying, he's basically getting across this, your faith is only as valid as it's based on truth. And our faith is valid because it's based on the truth of the resurrection. And faith is only effective if it is applied. Lest you believed in vain. Do you, you see what he's saying there? If you did not truly trust him as your savior, then you're yet in your sins. I'm thankful that he'll save you today. I'm thankful that you may have come here this morning not knowing for sure. I'm glad that you can go home like some did, even last week, knowing for sure. If I died today, now I know for sure I'm going to heaven. Not because of any good I've done in a week's time. You're following me. No, but because of what he did. As an eight-year-old boy, I'd heard this gospel message that I'm telling you today. I'd heard it all my life. My mom kept me in church. I'm so glad for that. But the age of eight on April the 1st, which is tomorrow, that's my, that's my born again birthday. It's when I trusted Jesus as my savior on April Fool's Day. <laughs> no trick on God's part on me. No, because he said, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. As an eight year old boy, I understood I was a sinner. There's nothing I could do to save myself. And I asked Jesus to be my savior. And listen, friend, that was the day I was saved. Amen. But that day began to change my life. See, that's not the end. That's just the beginning of this. I had a spell where I was away from God. I'm not proud of that, but others in this room understand what I'm talking about. Maybe you've had those times like that too. In fact, I got to such a place in my life that I began even to doubt my salvation. But I look back on it now, and I know that even in childlike faith, I understood what it meant to be saved, and I was genuinely saved at age eight. I didn't lose my salvation, because the Bible teaches you can't. But here's, here's what had happened. Even though I was hearing it on a regular basis, I wasn't really applying it to my life. I'm sure glad each and every one of you are here today. But I really want you to consider this. It's not enough for you just to be saved. Paul's saying this gospel has had a real deep effect in your life. And it changes everything. It gives you purpose and direction. And, and Paul is saying, listen, if, if you know this to be true, then it ought to be lived out in your life. And that's really what the rest of chapter 15 is largely about. As he says, awake to righteousness and sin not, for some have not the knowledge of God. That's in chapter 15. He says, evil communications corrupt good manners. That's in chapter number 15. As he says, don't hang out with those that are trying to tell you something otherwise because your faith is as valid as it's built on truth and your faith is valid because it's built on the truth of the word of God and faith is effective if you apply it. Amen. It needs to be applied. It's salvation, absolutely. But every day, I get to walk with the living Savior today. Amen. Applying that truth to every situation. Listening to me. Every situation of life. I serve a living Savior. Amen. I get to walk with Him again today. <laughs> he helps me when I'm down. Amen. He helps me when I'm overwhelmed. He helps me when I don't know what to do. He helps me when I think I do know what to do. He helps me see that I don't really know what I think. <laughs> that I really don't know what I'm doing sometimes <laughs> or what I'm saying. <laughs> you following? I've got a living Savior who walks with me daily and many in this room saying amen right now, they do as well because faith is not just to sit over here on the shelf every Easter you pick it up. No, it's to be every single day. He's alive. Amen. He's alive. Amen. But it's only effective if it's applied. The disciples were hiding 
for fear of the Jews. But once they saw the resurrected Savior, they couldn't be quiet about who it was that they served. They applied it. It changed their life. Has it changed yours? Father, thank you this morning. I'm glad we don't believe a fable, a myth, or a legend.